Okay, folks, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining. And um, I did miss the first session, so I want to take the opportunity here to say thank you to um, everybody who has been organizing this, uh, especially to uh, Leanne and to Megan Bronson, uh, to Laurie and to the administrative staff, uh, Tiffany and uh, Q and Brian, uh, for helping to put all of this together. Um, I have uh, great things about that first uh, set of presentations, and um, I think it's a, a reflection of the of the work that's being done, of course, but the number of um, publications that have emanated from this COVID research is quite impressive, um, which is really what prompted us to put all of this together in the first place. And it's not just the quantity of research that's uh, being done, it's the quality of that work too, and some of the high, highest impact uh, journals in the field. So um, congratulations to everybody who has helped put this together, but congratulations too to all of you who have been successful in contributing to our knowledge on COVID, uh, what is um, what's happening in terms of prevalence and uh, understanding the some of the basic mechanisms as well. Um, all of the publications that have been generated in Louisiana today have been collated uh, by Lori Stibe and uh, are available to you on our website, on the LACATS website. So it's just one more good reason to uh, access the LACATS uh, site. And I hope you all go in there and uh, check that out. Um, we are updating it uh, every two weeks and the work is continuing to roll in. So um, with that, I have one more shout out. That is to uh, the SEAL program. That is the Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19. This is uh, an NIH funded program. The last SEAL, Louisiana SEAL, is uh, headed by uh, Tanette Krause-Woods and by Daniel Sarpong, and is an initiative to help uh, combat COVID and to get information out to um, the community about COVID testing uh, and uh, vaccinations. So um, that group is has uh, just recently got funding and is actively engaged in their program right now. So congratulations to them and uh, best of luck to them in their work. So with that, I'm going to hand off to Dan Ford, who is our moderator for this afternoon. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Fort. I am the Biomedical Research Informatics Program Manager for the Auctioner Health System, and it is my pleasure to shepherd two exciting COVID investigators through the gauntlet of your intention. We uh, start with Dr. Amy Feehan. Originally from Chicago, Dr. Feehan attended Tulane University for her bachelor's and PhD in neuroscience, which was focused on drug development of non-addictive opioids for pain. Dr. Feehan was hired as an infectious disease research scientist under the guidance of Dr. Julie Garcia Diaz to explore how the gut microbiome affects neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's and cognitive complications of cirrhosis. As COVID-19 pandemic has unfolded, she collaborated with a local company to generate the first SARS-CoV-2 sequences from the New Orleans area. Planning, executing, and analyzing two prevalence studies in New Orleans and Baton Rouge has been her latest focus, and the data collected has clarified the nature of the pandemic here in Southern Louisiana. She has been grateful to help her community make decisions in government, school systems, and at the individual level. Amy, would you please start your presentation? Great. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, and thank you so much to the organizers uh, for including me. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so like Dan said, uh, my name is Amy Feehan. I'm a research scientist uh, in the clinical infectious disease research um, department at Oshner. Um, just wanted to first acknowledge the funders who helped make all of this work possible. Um, and of course, Pennington who helped us out with the uh, Baton Rouge prevalence study. Um, so the goal of any prevalence study is to determine the true spread of um, a disease. And so in this case, we were looking at SARS-CoV-2 in New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Um, we recruited adult residents over age 18 uh, to represent every age, race, ethnicity, and neighborhood. Um, and people with previous positive results were not eligible to participate, uh, and you'll see why in just a little bit. So uh, those who uh, volunteered to participate in the study, 
If they were selected, they were sent a text message um, telling them which of our sites to go to. Um, where they were consented, they took a short survey and then received the nasopharyngeal swab to test for an active viral infection um, and then a blood draw to test for antibodies. Um, so we ended up testing over 5,000 people between the two cities um, and the parishes that we tested are listed at the bottom. Uh, the green are obviously New Orleans and the orange are Baton Rouge. So just to give you context, uh, in case you haven't been looking at this every day of your life, um, this is Louisiana uh, Department of Health data showing the state recorded cases of um, COVID-19 in, uh, in air region one, which includes New Orleans, and then region two, which includes Baton Rouge. Um, in black highlighted here um, is the dates that we were doing testing. So for New Orleans, uh, we ended up testing everybody within just six quick days right at the end of that stay at home order. And then uh, in Baton Rouge, it was for two weeks um, during the initiation of that mask mandate after two phases of reopening. So that's just to give you the context and I'll keep uh, using those uh, graphics just to uh, help keep it in your mind. So we use paired PCR and antibody testing to give us kind of the full snapshot of what was going on. So um, this, this can put uh, any individual into one of three groups. So there's this early stage of infection where people would test positive on the PCR or that like nasopharyngeal swab um, where, when they had just been infected and were likely contagious. Um, and then as the virus starts to run its course, you get into this middle area where you're testing PCR positive still, there's still some like remnants of the virus, um, but you're also mounting an antibody response. Um, and we call that maybe like a late stage infection. Um, and then once you've cleared the infection, the IgG or antibody response remains in your blood um, and typically I've seen in publications that's like three months depending on who you are um, and how, how um, symptomatic you were. Um, and so for our overall just like highline data from the sample, um, the prevalence in New Orleans overall was just under uh, 7% um, and this was the breakdown. So for contagious, new contagious infections under 1% uh, in that early stage of recovery it was right at 1% and then the bulk of the sample was in that convalescent phase which if you look at the context makes a lot of sense. It was past this big wave of new infections um, and so there were very few, uh, you know, new contagious infections at this time, but a lot of people had been previously infected. Um, and then in Baton Rouge, it was almost a like 50-50 split between new and old infections. Um, and that kind of makes sense because here you can see there were a lot of, um, they were kind of in a wave of new infections, um, but not too, you know, cumulatively, it wasn't a huge spike in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and then listed underneath each of those is the percentage within that group that had no signs or symptoms whatsoever. And you can see that, it, especially in this group in New Orleans um, that were in the contagious stage, 75% of those had no signs or symptoms. In Baton Rouge, it was 61%. Um, and even in later stages of the disease. So here you could argue that some of those people are probably pre-symptomatic, so they just hadn't developed symptoms yet. Um, but even in these later stages, uh, you know, between 40 and 50% of people saying that they just never experienced any symptoms. Um, that's a really high rate of asymptomatic infection. Uh, so these are the maps, um, <clears throat> which kind of show you that uh, by zip code, there was high variability um, in how many people had been infected. Uh, the dots indicate where our testing locations were. Um, so we got pretty good geographic spread um, for the testing locations and then the lighter colors indicate lower prevalence, the darker colors indicate higher prevalence. So you can see it's kind of not uniformly distributed. Um, and then the summary numbers are here. So this is, on the last slide I showed you, it was 6.9% for New Orleans. As we adjusted um, by parish and by race, uh, that number went up a little bit. So these are the census adjusted numbers. And then if you take that percentage and multiply it by the population, you get that um, a pro uh, just a little over 64,000 residents had been infected at the time of testing in New Orleans and just over 36,000 residents um, in Baton Rouge. Uh, so if you directly, and remember we didn't include people who had previously tested positive because they were already counted in the state numbers. So you can add those, uh, our calculated numbers to the state numbers. Um, and in both cases, you get just under 10% prevalence. Um, and remember, this was, uh, you know, two months apart. So it looks like Baton Rouge had caught up to where New Orleans was in May. Um, so here, there's a lot of numbers on this screen, but um, I just wanted to show you quickly. We were very um, 
deliberate about making sure that we had a representative sample by race and ethnicity. Um, and so you can see in our sample, the percentage that fell under any of these categories, uh, and then in the overall population, and this is just for New Orleans, um, but we got pretty close on a lot of these. Um, and then if you look at, again, this is the census weighted numbers, you can see the overall infections, whether past or present, um, there's a huge racial disparity. So um, with white uh, individuals infected at about half the rate of black individuals. Um, and then that number is broken into two groupings. So this is the weighted point prevalence. That's that contagious group of new infections. And then the weighted seroprevalence, which is everybody who tested antibody positive. So the second two groups, either late stage infection or the convalescent group who had completely recovered from the infection. So if you take this weighted seroprevalence percentage and multiply it by the number of residents within each category, you can get the um, number of presumed recovered individuals uh, within that category. Um, and then we take the number of deaths over that calculated recovered um, plus the number of deaths to calculate the infection fatality ratio. So for every infection that's out there, um, how many people die? And if you look um, by race, even though the, obviously the deaths and the number of infections uh, within Black or African American individuals is definitely high, um, when you look at the total number of deaths over the total number of infections plus deaths, they're statistically similar to the overall IFR. Um, the only difference that we found was that in Asian individuals, there was a statistically significant lower IFR compared to um, white, black, and the overall. Um, again, just to reiterate, but in Baton Rouge, we did see uh, racial disparities again in the number of infected individuals. Um, but when you broke it down by point prevalence versus seroprevalence, there's, uh, the disparity goes away between white and black. Um, but we did notice a very high rate of new infections in Hispanic or Latino individuals. Um, and then if you look at the seroprevalence, uh, this kind of indicates obviously that um, early infections happened a lot more frequently in black or African American individuals. So they kind of bore the brunt of the pandemic early on. Um, getting to symptoms, so in this case, we've combined Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, the really standout symptom, which I'm sure everyone here has heard about, uh, is a, anosmia, or the loss, in this case, we asked about the loss of smell and or taste, but it's summarized using the, the term anosmia. Um, so it's very low uh, frequency in our sample, so not a lot of people reported that symptom, but within the positive group, 30% um, of those who tested positive had reported anosmia, and of the ones who reported anosmia, 40.6% of those tested positive. So just to visualize what I just said, um, if you're thinking about it from a symptom-focused testing perspective, uh, you're going to miss all of these people who are asymptomatic, which was almost half of the sample. Um, but if you're screening and asking about anosmia or the loss or alteration of smell and taste, uh, you're going to get over half of the symptomatic positive cases or 30% of the cases overall. Um, again, just to visualize this, if you were to just test everybody who had the loss of smell and taste, four out of 10 of them would be positive. Um, and there's actually a new preprint just posted from India, and they found that even the people who were essentially considered asymptomatic had trouble smelling peppermint and coconut. So something like that could be used as an easy, uh, easy way to screen, um, especially if it's targeting some of those like asymptomatic or low symptomatic population. Uh, this was a cluster analysis done by Dan Fort. Um, and so we found that when you clustered all of the symptom presentation together, um, in this first cluster, it was the very low or no symptom cluster. Uh, the average number of symptoms reported was under half of a symptom. Um, but still, anosmia was the most reported symptom in this group. Um, the second cluster was like the really symptomatic people. Um, almost all of them had fatigue, but a lot of like flu-like symptoms. Um, and these people would probably be caught by a symptom-oriented testing uh, strategy. And then there was a third group that was a little bit more discerning. So they on average reported four symptoms. Again, a lot of flu-like symptoms, but anosmia was detectable in almost half of them. Um, which just kind of underscores, um, you know, the, the way to distinguish maybe between COVID-19 and other respiratory illnesses could, could be anosmia. Um, 
summarized here. Um, and then just quickly, <clears throat> some odds ratios. So uh, again, if you reported anosmia, you were over, you had over 13 times higher odds of testing positive. The next highest was fever. So it's good that we're using that uh, as a screener as well. And then if you didn't have symptoms, you were must, much less likely to test positive. Um, but <clears throat> that, that brings up the question of, is it worth it to test asymptomatics? And I think most people would agree that it is if you have a reason to. So if you're doing contact tracing, uh, you know, you should be testing everyone who came in contact with a sick person regardless of their symptom status. So I guess the answer is sometimes. Uh, I'd also just like to point out that comorbidities didn't in influence your um, odds of testing positive, but obviously there's a lot of literature out there showing that they have impacts following infection. Um, and then finally, I'll leave you with this. So we did a um, probability model of reporting symptoms by age. And so um, in the younger group, so from age 20 to about 60, you see that the odds of, of saying, yes, I've had symptoms of some sort was higher than 50%. And then after you hit 60, it's kind of a decreasing probability of having symptoms. And this is kind of counter to um, anecdotal um, thoughts about how younger kids or younger adults tend to be more asymptomatic um, and, you know, get through the disease without any issues. Uh, actually, in our data, we found the opposite. Um, and then down here is just um, like a heat map of symptom frequency by age. Uh, you can see again, anosmia across the age span is a pretty good indicator. Uh, and then especially in like the 40 plus population, fatigue was a really big indicator. Um, and then here is just a summary slide. Um, I think I've talked through all of these points. Uh, and then so ultimately what we learned from our study is that, you know, obviously COVID-19 and, and SARS-CoV-2 is here to stay until we get a really effective vaccine that lots of people are willing to take. Um, and then especially in light of the fact that, you know, half of people are asymptomatic, it's really important to wear a mask because you, just because you feel fine right now is not an indicator that you are not sick. Um, and then it's also really important to participate in contact tracing, uh, even if you're asymptomatic. Obviously, wash your hands. Um, and then anosmia really could be a strong indicator or a good screening criteria moving forward. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you to the hundreds of people who made um, all of this testing possible uh, and take questions. Amy, since you were so efficient with the use of your limited time this afternoon, I do have a question. What would yes. you consider the most ideal population testing strategy in kind of a surveillance phase for COVID? Um, that's a really good question. And I guess, because we, we had a lot of conversations after um, finishing up the study, particularly in Baton Rouge, because it was the time that like schools were starting to reopen. Um, and I think uh, I think actually Tulane and a lot of other universities have an interesting approach where they'll um, just test a percentage of the population regularly, regardless of their symptom status or anything. It's just kind of like a random selection um, to use it as kind of like a monitoring um, tool. I guess when you're not, if you're not resource limited at all, you just have testing freely avail available to anyone. Um, but I know that especially with contact tracing at the state level, it hasn't gone as well as we had all hoped. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. <laughs> I guess it just kind of depends on your situation. But I would certainly say that symptomatic individuals and especially, obviously, people who are losing their sense of smell and taste should be prioritized for a test. And I know we had talked about in New Orleans using the whiskey test of just taking a nice sniff of whiskey in the morning. And if, you're, if you can smell it, you're okay. If not, you probably should see a doctor. <laughs> Yes, I've heard of the peanut butter version of that test. Uh, oh, I was sure. not aware of the whiskey <laughs> version of the test. Yeah. Are there any yeah. other questions for Dr. Feehan? I don't see anyone else not on mute. All right, then we'll have more time for questions at the end. So no one has to give up their chance. Uh, Let's see, Dr. Hu is the Weatherhead Presidential Chair in Biotechnology Innovation and also the Director of the Center of Cellular and Molecular Diagnosis at Tulane University School of Medicine. 
is the second endowed presidential chair at Tulane. Dr. Hu has a primary appointment in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and secondary appointments in the School of Science and Engineering, School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine and the Tulane National Primate Research Center. He's a pioneer in developing advanced diagnosis for personalized medicine, and I believe there are some sensitive, or, um, relevant implications of that research interest for uh, the diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2. So Dr. Hu, please tell us more about that. Thank you so much, Dan, uh, and also thank you, John, to uh, organize the, the, this event. So we're pretty honored to introduce uh, uh, the very recent progression on the SARS-CoV-2 detections. And so, um, you know, I want to just give the, the basic fact for, uh, for the COVID-19, because you, you got the information from the uh, newsletter and TV televisions every day. And but there's uh, several uh, several the um, key issues and the challenges for the current uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, detections. And the first thing is uh, uh, how to collect the, the, pro uh, the appropriate the specimen at the right time from the right uh, anatomic site in the, the pre-analytical stage. And because we know the uh, uh, we're going to uh, the introduce more details later, but. Uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 uh, is the SARS-CoV-2 not only stay uh, in the nasal or nasal pharyngeal and the uh, uh, swab, and uh, they can be spread to anywhere in the body. And, um, uh, and also, um, yeah, so the, the, what is the, the uh, biomarker we should test? Right now, the uh, RT-PCR for the nuclear assay test is still the gold standard. And uh, also, the antibody test in this, uh, the in blood is a uh, is a uh, uh, complementary complementary part. But we do have uh, uh, the our group also developing the, some other biomarkers which can help the more accurate or more personalized diagnosis for SARS-CoV-2. And also, the um, uh, the point of care device that can really the facilitate the rapid and accurate diagnosis and the monitoring the uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections with a uh, random access. And uh, uh, so let's start. So um, in my point of view, and so what's the urgent need for SARS-CoV-2 uh, diagnosis? And uh, there's uh, three the key priorities. And the first is uh, Sensitivity, because right now the, uh, the, there's a still a lot of uh, clinical doctors complain the um, uh, commercialized uh, uh, detection platforms or IC product and the uh, uh, lack like of uh, the sensitivity to capture the pa patients who has the infections, and also the uh, we don't have uh, much point of care options yet, and uh, because some point of care device they're still suffering from the uh, this trade-off. Uh, between the point of care point portability and the uh, sensitivity, and also reliability, and what's the, the sample uh, best uh, um, is uh, have the most useful for uh, the clinical diagnosis. Um, so uh, why we want to develop the high sensitive uh, detection platform? So uh, the, and how we detect, how we uh, generate. The, this. So we inter introduced uh, the CRISPR uh, technology into this, uh, um, in, into the, in, the sensitivity improvement. And uh, so uh, CRISPR is a uh, uh, pretty hot names. And because the, the two ladies just got the, uh, the Nobel Prize for this year's the, the chemistry uh, no Nobel Chemistry uh, Award. So uh, here's uh, the, how we get this. So the first, there's a two step to uh, enable us to get the, um, the ultra sensitive uh, signals. And the first step is the, the, um, the exothermal applications, um, which is uh, pretty similar to the PCR, uh, but a uh, special equipment is not required. And the second part is the, the uh, most important step at the CRISPR to further amplify the signal. And let's see what happened here. So the first, uh, the, the guide RNA bound to the uh, target DNA from uh, the RNA and the DNA hybrid. So we uh, designed uh, the guide RNA, which targeted the specific sequence of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this single strand RNA has two parts, and uh, 
Um, so it has two parts. First, the, the half can uh, first the half can target the DNA, which is uh, from the uh, reverse uh, transcri transcription of the SARS-CoV-2, and the other half can bind to the uh, the uh, case 12A protein. And uh, then the uh, the RNA and uh, DNA and RNA recruit the um, the the uh, case 12A. Uh, to form the complex, and now the uh, case 12A uh, is activated to cut the single strand, single uh, strand DNA. And um, the, we designed the uh, single strand DNA probe, and uh, the, the DNA probe is ended to uh, activate the case 12A, and uh, um, it's a, it will be cut and release the fluorescence signal uh, quickly. So the final reading on out, the final reading out will be a high throughput and it can incorporate with a, a 96 or 384 84 wells <laughs> the plate reader. Uh, the, so the reading procedure can be finished in two minutes. All right, so, um, and, uh, so let's move like this. Hold on one second. Okay. All right, so uh, to permit the, uh, Direct comparison of uh, the uh, of the result from our proposed approach uh, with those uh, established methods in the uh, clinical use, and we design the primer and the guide RNAs to target the SARS-CoV-2 uh, ORF1AB and the, the N reagent uh, analyzed by the CDC assay. So um, the bioinformatics uh, at the analysis of these primers and the guide RNAs against the common um, the uh, virus and other the pathogens uh, reveals that uh, those sequence we selected has a very strong specificity, and uh, uh, so the the uh, other comparison also showing the method is a is a uh, is inhibit the the best specificity for the positive and the negative samples. And also uh, the, there's a uh, very good specificity for COVID-19 uh, or for SARS-CoV-2 compared to the MERS and the SARS. And um, uh, so since the CRISPR activity determines the sensitivity of the assay, and uh, we also conducted uh, uh, the very comprehensive uh, studies of its uh, reaction, uh, reaction kinetics uh, to optimize the IC performance, like the ratio of uh, uh, the case 12A to the get, get RNA uh, to, to reporter, and also incubation time, and also temperature. And um, so uh, this is a, um, the manuscript um, just published on the advanced science, and it, it's not a come from our group, but uh, our method was listed in the one of the, their tables. And uh, so, uh, so then uh, we just found out uh, by today, uh, to today, and our method is still the most sensitive, most sensitive SARS-CoV-2 detection, I say. And uh, so the list of uh, the, the limit of the detection is 0 0.1 uh, copy numbers per microliter. Um, actually, the uh, our limit of detection, it should be the 0 0.05, yeah, uh, but it's still the, the highest one. So we really like that this paper can be uh, read by, by the world and uh, the, everybody will know the, um, the highest uh, sensitive uh, detection, I say, is in the state of Louisiana. Um, okay, so then uh, this is uh, the very uh, early the clinical validations we conducted with the, with the, the support from the Tulin Pathology Lab. So we compared our result with the, the Pathology Lab's uh, the, um, RT PCR and also the, the state lab uh, result. So you can tell uh, by using the CRISPR uh, enabled assay, uh, we can get the very definitive result for the positive and the negative cases. And um, so the second uh, phase is uh, uh, how we make the point of care staff and, uh, and also if there are any uh, more convenient samples we can, we can serve, we can detect. So uh, in this uh, phase, we select the saliva as the substrate and also trying to generate the cell phone based detector. 
And um, so the, eventually this, uh, this method can provide the direct loading uh, of a saliva for detection and the turnaround time uh, within the 20 minutes. And also it's a cell phone readout and everybody can handle, okay? So uh, again, we also uh, conducted a very comprehensive uh, uh, IC optimization. And uh, so for the several parameters and uh, uh, so and the re uh, maximize the sensitivity of this IC is still maintained at a 0 0.5, 0 0.5 copy, a 0 0.05 copy number per micrometer. And uh, here is the device. We collaborate with the, another group at the, um, the North Carolina. And uh, so we generated the, uh, a battery powered the fluorescence detector on the cell, uh, which can incorporate with uh, the cell phone. So, and we also uh, conducted uh, the correlation study between the cell phone and also the benchtop RT-PCR. And uh, um, it's okay, the correlation is okay. And uh, also the phase three. So, and uh, everybody right now is uh, the, everybody knows the nasal swab test and the, also the saliva test. And, and uh, is that uh, good enough? And so there's a, a lot of uh, papers mounting evidence indicate that SARS-CoV-2 can produce a very complicated extrapulmonary COVID-19 disease uh, manifestation. So RT-PCR analysis of uh, swab species collected from nasal or uh, the nasal pharyngeal swabs is a reference of standard. However, the such analysis can yield the false negative due to the transient viral shedding or the sampling issues, sampling issues uh, in this uh, specimen. And uh, so uh, the sensitive detection of uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the blood could theoretically uh, serve a universal diagnostic for SARS-CoV-2 infection. But so far, and uh, uh, if you read a lot of the uh, paper compare the viral load test uh, uh, in the different uh, sample types and the uh, uh, blood, its blood test is uh, still very poor due to the, um, the poor sensitivity of other assay. Okay, so uh, then we target, we, the, our graduate students start working on this and also generating the highly specific, highly specific uh, detection assay, but it's still using the CRISPR, but this time, and uh, we compared more other pathogens to ensure the specificity of the detection and, uh, and uh, well maintain the uh, low uh, limit of detection, okay? Um, and also this time we also compare, we got the, the strong support from our primate centers. So uh, they, uh, in fact, uh, the, some monkey models. And uh, so we got the samples at a baseline and the first day of the infraction, six day and 13 day and 20 days until the, they're all being killed. And so um, we got the pretty consistent result by using the uh, CRISPR test for the different, for the several different uh, uh, specimen, and uh, first we can tell from the nasal swab, and uh, from the nasal swab, and uh, the viral load to reach the peak at the six days after the infection, and up afterwards they're going down. And uh, but for rectal swab and the plasma is gradually increasing. So that's actually also indicating us. And for most the patients at the middle, middle stage or later stage of the infection, maybe the serum, uh, the, the plasma samples could be more reliable compared to the nasal or nasal pharyngeal uh, swabs. Um, and so the, then we also got samples from, we also got samples from the pathology lab at the Tulane Hospital. And uh, uh, we, we uh, it's a, the, Pretty good uh, specificity show, is showing between the, I think it's 30 patients and also 30 uh, health controls. And also because uh, the CRISP, uh, one challenging for the general CRISPR technology is very difficult to set up quantification protocol. And uh, our um, uh, graduate student, uh, Jen Huang, uh, also developed the, the uh, quantification, quantification method. So you can tell the, uh, there is a certain of number of patients we can do the quantification of viral load using the CRISPR. And um, uh, the, 
uh, the panel showing on the right side is uh, the samples we got from longitudinal samples we got from the uh, the New Orleans Children's Hospital. And uh, so those patients was uh, someone was diagnosed by the RT-PCR. And uh, you can tell uh, right after the first visit and their RT-PCR turned to negative, like uh, showing in the panel D. And uh, uh, but after two over two months, and they back to positive again. But for us, we can detect the positive signal much longer than the uh, than the nasal swab, and but their antibody IgG is show uh, is always showing the positive, and uh, uh, we also help the, the clinical doctors and uh, um, to figure out the it's much uh, it's, uh, the when they have the, some patients their question if they're the uh, if they're um, the the COVID positive or uh, or not. So, for example, we have we have a many we have a serve the many patients, many doctors, and but there's the two typical cases, and the, the panel A is showing the uh, the result from the 54 years old fe uh, female patients, and uh, so at first they detected something abnormal in the CT scan, and but their RT PCR is inactive, so uh, then they. Uh, they ask for help from us, and we spend some time to establish the the, uh, the IRB and also consent form. Then we test them. We test their blood, and uh, their blood is show the plasma is showing the very strong signals. Um, so then uh, they just um, uh, start uh, the the CCP treatment, and the the patient got a improvement. And the second uh, patient is 20 years old, the 26 years old, the female. And uh, they also question if they may have the COVID, but for our blood test, it's inactive. So they just uh, uh, start antibiotic, uh, the treatment, and the patient also got the, uh, the improvement. And so we're also trying to collaborate with Amy at the Oshner, and uh, uh, is there any, the, 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 but the problem is actually a very common problem. And the most uh, protocol for blood collection or for sample collection uh, it's not suitable for the, um, uh, the nucleic acid detection. And uh, because sometimes they just stay on the, on the shelf or on the fourth degree refrigerator uh, very long for seven days. And uh, once they transfer to us, it cannot, uh, uh, the, all the RNA has been degraded. So it's uh, very difficult to, to, uh, to detect the, the biomarker anymore. Is there any uh, any new the biomarker spaces we can use? And uh, so to address this issue and also uh, resume the collaboration with Amy, so we just uh, focus on the exosome. So the exosome, if you don't know the, uh, what is the exosome, so the, this is a very small bubble generated in the cell, any type of cell, including the, pas uh, the, the pathogen cells. And so they can encapsulate a lot of orange, you know, uh, the information like uh, the protein, microRNA, sometimes DNA, and also the viral, viral RNA uh, in the, this small bubble. And they will flow, uh, they, they can flow uh, extracted to the, uh, to the, to the outside uh, when they have the fusion effect the, uh, with the cell membrane. So if you can capture those uh, small bubbles in the blood or other bodily fluid, you may capture the, some original information from the, from the, uh, the pathogen cells. So um, here is, uh, the, we, we have been working on this biomarker for, for a while for infection disease, for cancers. And uh, uh, so the extracellular, we also call it extracellular vesicle. And uh, uh, they have several the several advantage as a biomarker. The first, as I mentioned, they carry a lot of original information. And the second, abundance. Compared to the nucleic acid, compared to the antigens, the abundance of uh, uh, exosome is a lot. One cell can secrete 10,000 10, uh, vesicles every day. And in the one microliters of plasma, you can detect up to 10 to the seventh power of vesicles. And availability, they, you can detect, uh, you can cap, you can collect uh, the vesicles from urine, from the saliva, and also blood. And uh, so, um, and but how to capture? But uh, to capture the viral RNA in the exosome, 
And first, uh, we use a CRISPR, we can detect them, but uh, the background is uh, too high. So then we generate uh, uh, the new method, uh, which, ca which called uh, the, the liposome fusion method. So we, at first, uh, we, encapsulate, uh, we encapsulate all the CRISPR regions in the liposome. Liposome, and uh, this uh, have the, the similar size as an uh, uh, extracellular vesicle. And uh, when we use the, the exo exosome specific uh, uh, membrane protein antibody to capture all the exosome on the glass slide, then we'll apply the liposome on it. And uh, in, the, in, this, in this procedure, the liposome will have a fusion effect and uh, they will um, the fuse together and uh, deliver all the CRISPR reagent to the, uh, to the, to the, to the exosome. And then they will uh, find out the, the target RNA and the profile, the, uh, the, the signal right here. And uh, so they here, and also the, um, see, the preparation of the liposome, uh, encapsulating all the, the, uh, the CRISPR region is pretty simple. Uh, so here, here, the TEM transmission electron microscopy is showing how we can uh, the fuse the liposome and the exosome and also the uh, the nano nano um, nanosat data is also showing how we can the um, the how we got this complex and so we also do the we also uh, optimize the the timing of the incubation and also the validate the the this the clinical performance of this assay in a certain number of uh, positive patients and the uh, and health control. Um, so in the, another project, we also like to study the antibody, but not the whole protein of the IgG and the IgM. We like to study the, we like to see the, which epitope is the early, earliest responder uh, for this virus. So uh, we, we also collaborate with another research group and generating the, the proteomics microarray and uh, we split all the, the uh, virus and proteins um, into the 15 amino acid uh, peptide. Then, uh, uh, then we got the, the, it's a, the performance of each fragment is really different through the, uh, the uh, infection time. So that's actually facilitated us to identify the, um, the earliest responder site of the IgG, IgM, and also we're also trying to find out if there's uh, any possibility for us to, uh, to identify the neutralization, neutralizing uh, the antibodies. Um, so uh, we really like to appreciate uh, um, all the collaborators' contributions. And uh, so uh, they're not only contributing the samples, mo animal models, they're also contributing the ideas and what's the urgent need in the clinic for pandemic control. So, um, and also our group. And so at least the two, two pictures, one was taken before the pandemic and the, the other one is during the pandemic. And especially I wanna uh, the emphasize the uh, Dr. Boning and, uh, and Jen Huang, uh, they're the, um, playing the major role in the CRISPR technology and uh, also uh, the Dr. Li Yang is working on the proteomics array, and also Chris is uh, also in charge of uh, the um, of the this pro project. And uh, Dr. Jia Fang is assistant professor in our department. is also working on the uh, the COVID nineteen proteomics study. Um, and in our center, and we also have several other uh, technology and uh, serving the detection ultra sensitive and the specific detection of infection disease, cancer disease. And if you're interested, and feel free to email me. Um, all right, then. Well, fantastic talk. I'm extremely glad I sat here and had a reason to uh, participate, well, or at least observe. I do have one question to get things kicked off. Um, abstracting away from the primate data, I was wondering if you had any insight into what kind of lead time your I mean, mind-boggling low detection threshold uh, implies in days post-infection for um, detection. So obviously, you know, there's, there's an infection point that was controlled here. Um, you're showing uh, substantial 
So that's one day after infection. So this, that uh, looks like, uh, let's see, one, two, I mean, the majority of your sample, clearly, but at least more than half, if not all of them, might be tagged as um, infected a single day after infection. So that is probably pre-symptomatic and likely pre-infectious possibly. And I'm wondering if you've thought about the kind of policy and testing implications um, it would take to roll this up to uh, wide population screening or, or if that's even possible. Um, certainly well, most yeah. of your methods, yeah, uh, please continue. Well, Sure, yes, thanks, that's a good question. And uh, actually, uh, I didn't emphasize this. All this model is there asymptom uh, asymptomatic. Yeah, none of them have the, any uh, symptomatic uh, symptom symptoms. And um, uh, I would say that the, the, um, the, they applied a very aggressive way to do infection, these models. And that's why uh, for the nasal swab and then for the nasal swab, and also the nasal pharyngeal uh, swab, we can detect the signal pretty early. And most of the models, they're showing the very strong, they're showing the, uh, the dramatically increasing signals in the, in the first day right after the infection. And so, um, and uh, the, uh, well, to answer to your questions, uh, the, uh, if it's necessary to apply the such sensitive uh, method for the for the screening um, I, I would say it's uh, um, it's necessary it's especially right now the CDC want to uh, start the pooling strategy and if you put all the method uh, all the samples you actually also dilute the biomarkers concentration so uh, in that case you really need the, the more sensitive uh, detection I say and um, uh, so we can well, we, our preliminary result also showing we can capture more positive, but uh, it's a, it, is a, it doesn't hurt the specificity, but we can capture more patients, which is asymptom, asymptomatic patients, and uh, um, but the, there's no any follow-up study setting up for the further evaluation yet. So we're looking for the collaborations. Yes, it's funny you mentioned, well, not funny, you mentioned pool testing. I think pool testing is important. I think um, you're probably extremely aware that the math on the efficiency of pool testing changes dramatically based on the expected prevalence. Yeah. Um, but given you're talking, what, it's 296 wells in your uh, assay? Yeah. Something uh, large. I was wondering if uh, anyone has considered um, mixing different small pools for parallel testing which would test, pool test in the same amount of time, but would better isolate um, which people would need to be individually tested. Yeah, uh, right now, currently the CDC, uh, the CDC's assays, uh, the limit of detection for them is a 10 copy number per micron liter, uh, but ours is uh, the 0 0.05, so. So for a uh, low prevalence, you could actually effectively test uh, an infectious, well, symptomatic infection, well, even asymptomatic, an infectious person in a much larger pool. A single infectious person in a much larger pool would still be detected. Right, that's uh, theoretically correct. All right, and with that, we have a couple of, oh, Amy, please. Uh, so with, because you can get such a low um, uh, limit of detection, is there a chance that you could pick up on like scraps of the virus that are just hanging out either in the saliva or nasopharyngeal space that aren't actually part of an infection, but it's just pieces of the virus? Well, we don't have such sample. <laughs> we like to know too. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that, that sounds like a you problem, Amy, not a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just curious, but uh, yeah, I. I think too, with this, I mean, do you see this as being something that like the individual tests are pretty cost effective if it was implemented in like a clinical lab? I guess if you could do the pooled testing, that would bring your costs down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can, we can really discuss this, but uh, we don't have uh, the, such individual samples yet. Okay. 
Yeah, and ironically, the larger the pool, um, so when you end up with a positive test in a large pool, you have to undergo what's effectively a binary search strategy. So you have to divide the pool in half, test half, and discard the negative half, and then keep going until you identify. Absolutely. So it has interesting, cost has impl interesting implications when you can both parallelize and then repeatedly do it very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, we do have a couple more minutes for anyone else in our uh, prestigious audience with questions. You actually didn't show. I have a question for Andrew. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have a question for Amy. Um, that, I'm curious about the, the symptomatology reported uh, symptom scale, or was that? Um, upon diagnosis and recording the symptoms? Um, so you cut out a little bit there. Was it, uh, so just to give you the um, background on our design, so these people were recruited and they self-reported symptoms uh, and then we tested them. So the test came back positive or negative later, but we asked them about symptoms that they had had over the past two months um, and then asked them when they were having those symptoms. So if they came back and they had, you know, PCR positive and they had had symptoms within the past couple of weeks, then you can say like, okay, this, this infection seems to be symptomatic. Um, and if they had like an antibody positive test and said that, you know, sometime in the past couple of months they had had these symptoms, then we assumed that that was a symptomatic case. Yeah, because it, it's interesting. I just wonder whether or not the younger people that don't experience the symptoms as often uh, sort of, saw them as more prominent, uh, older individuals that, you know, have been around a long time, get symptoms often and don't really yes. think too much about them. Is that sort of in the game there? Definitely. Yeah. So, and actually it's true. We even checked within our data, but you can probably assume that it's true that older individuals have a lot more uh, comorbidities and could have, you know, uh, symptoms from those comorbidities or, you know, like fatigue and achiness, it only gets worse with age, right? Um, so yeah, that definitely could be a part of it. Uh, however, I will say as someone who's intimately familiar with this particular data set, uh, it's equally true that if you are using these data to inform a broad population testing strategy, you are effectively relying on that person's self-reported symptoms regardless. Yeah. Well, I would especially like to thank our two speakers and everyone who took time this afternoon to uh, attend virtually. And I have a few notes from our generous LaCats sponsor that I am definitely not reading off the side of my screen. A recording of today's session will be available in the next day or so. It will be shared via the LaCats listserv and posted to YouTube. Our next LaCats COVID-19 Chronicle Seminar will be held Thursday, October 29th at 4 p.m. Please join us then for talks given by Drs. Jay Coles, PhD, and Nokla Saba, MD, both from the Tulane School of Medicine. And finally, we are looking for more speakers. If you or someone you know would like to share their COVID-19 related works, please email info at lacats.org. And yes, that means you can volunteer all of your friends and co-authors and not volunteer yourself. Dr. Kerwin, do you have any final closing remarks? Uh, you are on mute, so mm -hmm. I'll assume that's a yes, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Still haven't mastered the mute button. <laughs> no, I want to say thank you to the presenters. This was, uh, was outstanding science and uh, really informative. Um, so uh, I hope that uh, you can spread the word, everybody, that, that this, these sessions are going on. It's a great opportunity, really, to hear and learn a lot more about COVID um, and uh, the science behind it. So um, I hope that we see you all back again uh, in a couple of weeks. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.